It was Memorial Day 2015 when Carlos and his friends arrived at Shell Island in Florida. He never imagined what was about to happen to him. While taking a swim by himself in the back shore of the island, suddenly an underwater current trapped him, dragging him half a mile away from the shore. After battling in the water for almost one hour, he was exhausted and finally decided to stop resisting and thus he surrendered. As he later expressed, I was completely in tears and could barely manage to stay afloat, so I took a deep breath and I began to pray. And then, during the agony of what he believed were his last moments, he heard a calm voice behind him, whispering and giving a start to the most amazing chapter of his life an NDE story he calls Help from Heaven. Hi, we're here with Carlos Vivas. He is the author of Help from Heaven. This is a book he wrote after having a near-death experience. And in this book, he shares his story of hope and love, and he describes the two events surrounding his near-death experience. First of all, I want to thank Carlos for coming here and welcome him. Hi, Carlos. How are you? Thank you so much for inviting me to your channel. I'm really good right now. I'm just excited uh, to tell my story in your channel. Thank you. Okay. Apart from being the author of Help from Heaven, Carlos is also the administrator of the F Facebook group Beyond Near Death Experiences. I opened this, this uh, webpage on Facebook, this group, because I was feeling alone at the beginning. I thought this experience happened to me. And uh, I, I went to Google and I started searching to see what's more people. And I started finding a community. And I, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to open my own community and I'm going to bring people uh, so we can share the same experiences. And every experience is different, but it's, it's re they are really amazing experience. So I'm, I'm really glad that I opened the group a year ago. And we're almost a thousand people right now there. Uh, right now, I want to know well, what made you write this book, Help from Heaven? Miracles happen when you believe. You told me it was a sort of mission. Yes, uh, I wrote the book in, during the pandemic. Uh, it was hard for me because I was trying to write the book for years before. But for one reason or another, for work, a lot of inconvenience came and I, I couldn't write the book. Um, when did you publish it? Uh, when did you publish it exactly? August 26, 2021. That was when my publisher, uh, Neil Degree Press, uh, published the book on Amazon. It's on right. Amazon Barnes and Noble right now. Oh, say, okay, what can you tell us about your near death experience? You were drowning, I understand. So, can you tell us yes. what happened? Yeah, I'll tell you a little quick. So, I went with some friends to the beach in Panama City Beach here in Florida. And it was Memorial Day 2015. It was a lot of people coming to the beach that day. We went to three different places and everything was packed until I told my friends, you know what, let's go to an island that I always go. You have to pay $20 to get there. So I don't think it's going to be too many people there. So let's go there. So we went to the, a park. It's called San Andrew State Park. We paid $20 to get in and then $20 to get the boat to go to the island. When we finally arrived to the island, the base out of the island was packed with people because it was a, a, a holiday, Memorial Day, right? So I told my friends, let's go to the back of the island that's open ocean. I don't think nobody's going to be there. So we started walking from the bay side to the back of the island. When we were half of the way, there was a guy there with four kids and said, excuse me, sir, where do you think you're going? And I says, I'm going to the other side because this part 
of the island is full. I said, like, if I were you, don't go there because it's dangerous. I said, like, oh, don't worry, I'm not superstitious. Nothing's going to happen, sir. I've been coming to this island for years. Anyways, I continued walking. We arrived to the back of the island, and we stayed there from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. We put a tent. We put chairs. Uh, we have an amazing day the whole day. And around 4 p.m., uh, my friends told me, Carlos, where you want to uh, walk around the island? I said, okay, guys, you go and walk around the island. And because I've been coming here for several years, I know this, this island. So I take care of the stuff here, the chairs, the tent, and the food and everything. You guys can walk, but you have one hour before the last boat leave the island. So I was there. They left. I was by myself. There was nobody around me. And then I said, I'm just going to swim. Just to let you know, when I was a child, I was a swimmer on a team, so I'm not a, afraid to swim, right? So I jumped into the water, everything was fine, the water was warm, but then in minutes, something came under the water and grabbed me, and it was a riptide current. I didn't know a rip, what a riptide current was, so I started fighting with this riptide. It's like a tornado, like a twister under the water. So I didn't know. So okay, like, twister, a, like a whirlpool. Yes, like a whirlpool under the water. Okay. And how I explain to people the way that it feels is if you watch the movie Finding Nemo, when all the fish is going through a tunnel under the water and get thrown far, far away into the ocean, that's the same thing that happened to me. So when that tunnel, that whirlpool took me all the way into the ocean, when I pulled my head out of the water, I was like half a mile away from the island. So I was like, what? How in the world did I get here? So I said, okay, I just need to swim back. So I start swimming, swimming, swimming. But guess what? Every time that I pulled my head out of the water, I was farther and farther and farther from the island. After 30 minutes fighting and fighting and fighting, I started getting cramps on my arms, on my legs. And I said to myself, you know what? There is no way I'm going to get out of here. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm not moving, even that I'm swimming. But uh, I think this is it. So in that moment, I looked to heaven and I said, okay, God, I never thought that today is going to be my last day, but I'm going to tell you something. From today, I want to say thank you. Thank you to my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters. Thank you for everything you gave me, and I'm sorry if I did something wrong. And in that moment, I heard a voice behind me that said, ask for help. And I looked back, and I didn't see anyone. I was like, what? And then I heard again, ask for help. And then I get mad. I said, oh, really? Is anybody around me? Because I've been here for 30 minutes drowning. Could you help me, please? Nothing, just the win again. I'd like to ask you one question. Sure. Was this the first time you heard that voice? This is the second time, actually, that I heard that voice. Okay, when did you hear it before? We will, we will make a parenthesis here. Okay. And, and, and let's go back a little further. Okay, okay. Okay. So when I was 14 years old, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer, leukemia. So when we visited like 10 doctors with my mom and dad, we went from hospital to hospital. No doctors want to say what I had until we went to a hematologist that was a specialist on blood, right? So when we went to this doctor, he did a, a series of tests on me. And after four tests, he said, like, look, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but you have a terminal disease and there is nothing that we can do for you. You have three months to leave. And I was like, what? I have three months to leave? My mom and my dad was, were in front of me. I was standing in the back. And then I heard this voice for the first time in my life that I, that I said, he don't have the last word I had. And I was like, what? <laughs> But I didn't want to say anything to my parents because my mother was very strict. So I thought so to myself, if I say old, How old just, were you then? How old 14 you? years old. 14 and years the voice old. said, he doesn't have the last word. I do. I have, yes. Okay. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and then uh, I, I, I wasn't scared of anything because it felt, that voice felt very comfortable. My mother started telling the doctor, doctor, you have to save my son. The doctor said, I'm sorry, we did all the tests. There is no way you guys came too late. And the doctor said, well, I'm going to give you two options. The two options is go, is going traveling to Houston, Texas and do a bone marrow transplant or going to France and get a formula that I'm working with another doctor is called Android. At the end, my mom took the formula from France. 
uh, they bring me the formula to my house. I start drinking it. And for the first month, nothing was working. And after the first month, the doctor said, I'm sorry, it's working very little. All my Y cells there were dying and they weren't reproducing like they should be, right? And then while my mom crying, my dad crying, I feel terrible because I said, God, what I have done to deserve this, you know? And then I have a, I have a, something that came to me. I said, why you don't ask your uncle? And I have an uncle that have a lot of money. I said, like, oh, we can ask my uncle. He can give us the money to go to Houston, Texas and do the bone marrow transplant. So I asked my mom, mom, can I call my rich uncle and ask for the money? And my mom said, like, no, 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 no. You don't know that uncle, please don't even try, okay? I said, okay, Ma, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, cool. Then my mom go to work, my dad go to work, and I stay by myself at home. I said, like, wait a minute, I'm going to die. They don't want to die. I'm going to call my doctor. So I call my, my, my doctor, my uncle. So when I call my uncle, I explain everything what was happening. I said, like, please, could you help us with the money? I swear to God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work all my life to pay you back. And he said, Carlos, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And he hung up the phone. In that moment, everything turned black around me in my world. This is it. And I said, okay, this is it. I'm going to die. And then, wait a minute, something like a little light bulb turned on in my head. I said, like, that is God. So in that moment, I went to the floor. I went on my knees and I said, God, I'm starting a Catholic school. And they said that it's a God to help you when you have a need. If you ask with all your heart. So I please ask you, if you take this cancer away from me, I promise you, I'm going to tell the whole world that you're real because I'm going to be a living proof that you are real. I'm dying, but I have the paperwork that I was dying and you saved me. Well, from that day, I started praying. And, I, and in that moment, I feel like a warm all over my body. So I felt like the Holy Spirit or something came through me. And I felt like secure. So that made me feel confident that from that day I started declaring. Nobody told me this. This just came to me. Like, thank you for my healing. Thank you for my healing. I was praying with a lot of faith. And you know, faith moved mountains, right? So I was super, I mean, happy that everything is going to be fine. Uh, I'm praying to God every day. And after three months, the doctor called my parents and said, okay, it's time to do the last test on a CT scan to see how the sickness is going through Carlos' body. But we went to the hospital with my mom, my dad. They put me on the CT scan machine. The CT scan did all the work. And when the results came out, it was completely blank. The cancer completely disappeared. And in that moment, my mom was like, oh, my God, doctor, this is a miracle. And the doctor said, no, 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 this is not a miracle. So the doctor had like a bulldog face, like a dog face. And my mom, what's going on? What, what do you have that face? I said, this is called remission. Remission is when the cancer disappear and this then come back worse later. So I think that's what your son had. And in that moment, I heard the voice again. And the voice said, don't worry, this will never happen again. So that was my first time that I heard that voice. Wow, that's great. So you had heard that voice, and was it exactly the voice you heard when you were drowning? Yes, it was exactly the same voice. Yes. Okay, so let's continue. You are drowning, and you hear that voice. What did so I hear say? that voice, yeah, and in that moment I said, God, please, I just want to say thank you for my mom, thank you for my dad, thank you for my brothers and sisters, thank you for everybody that I met when I was alive, when I was still in this world, and I just want to say thank you for everything, and I'm sorry if I did something wrong for you. In that moment, that's when I heard that voice behind me that said, ask for help, three times, and at the, after three times, I said, okay, okay, I'm going to ask for help, so I started screaming, for me, It was like, I will never survive this because I barely could see the island. And then I started waving my hands. Okay, help, 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 help. I'm trying to yell from the top of my lungs, right? And I'm yelling and yelling and yelling. And guess what? At the end of the island, one of my friends from the group came out of the group because he felt something was wrong. So he went back to the tent and he didn't saw me. He walked around where we were. He didn't saw me. So he went to the top of a hill. And from the hill, he saw me. I said, like, Carlos, Carlos, he started jumping. I'm going to call 911. Hold on, hold on. But he didn't call 911. He went back to the tent. He grabbed a tubing 
and he went to the top of the hill and he dropped the tubing, thinking that the tubing is going to fly a mile away from where I was, right? Anyways, that didn't work. Then the guy's like, hold on, hold on, wait a little bit more. So he went to the other side of the island and started bringing people that was boarding the boat going back to Panama City. And in that moment, a lot of people started coming, six guys from the top of the rocks, jump into the water. Everybody was swimming through me. And I was like, oh, my God, thank you. When I saw everybody coming to me, it's like, thank you, God. They're going to save me. They're going to save me. And I was waiting and waiting. And then I heard a thunder behind me. And when I looked back, the sky and everything was turning black behind me. And they started coming big waves. So everybody started turning around because nobody could reach me. So in that moment, I said to myself, okay, God, you know what? I don't want to fight anymore. Whatever you want from this moment, just, just do it. I'm just going to surrender. And in that moment of surrender, and I make a parenthesis here because I tell people how many times in your life you have something that you cannot deal with. And the only thing you can do is surrender. You're fighting with your husband, your wife, at school, at work. Uh, you have something, a sickness in your life, and you cannot fight with it. You just need to surrender. So that's what I did. I surrendered. And in that moment, a huge wave came and crushed me all the way under the ocean. As soon as I went under the ocean, I opened my eyes under the water and I see a big shadow that's coming my way. So I thought it was a shark. So I covered my face thinking that this shark is going to attack me and it's going to bite me. But guess what is my surprise? That thing grabbed me by my stomach and pushed me all the way to the top of the surface. So when I get back to the top of the surface, I look back and guess what it was? It was a big dolphin. And I start crying. I couldn't believe that a dolphin was saving my life in that moment. I was crying. I look in the face of the dolphin and I grabbed the dolphin by the tail right there. And I stayed there for like 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, a feature boat show up in front of me. So the guy said, son, I'm going to save you, but you need to, to I, you need to stay there. I'm going to throw you a rope. So he threw me a rope. I said, I cannot get close to you because the waves, they are so big, I'm going to hit you with my boat. So come with the rope. So I start going with the rope. When I arrived to the boat, the boat was tall. And I said, okay, sir, hold on, give me one second. So I grabbed air like, because I've been there for like 45 minutes to an hour. So I'm like, and the guy's like, what are you doing? I said, like, what are you talking, sir? I said, like, what are you doing? I said, like, sir, I'm tired. I have cramps all over my body. And then he said, like, no, 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 you don't understand. You need to come in right now. I said, what are you talking about? I said, my body's sinking. I said, your body's sinking? How, what? And he said, well, I have a pump in my boat and the pump is stopped. So all the waves, they're getting inside of my boat. So you need to hurry up, go to the back of the boat. There are some steps there and jump in inside of the boat. So I go around the boat. The dolphin is still with me. I see the steps. I jump in. But as soon as I jump in, the water was like this inside of the boat. So I get, I see the water, everything floated. And I said, sir, do you have a bucket? I take the water out of the, the boat. I said, like, no, 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 we don't have time for that. Sit down. So I sit down. He starts driving around the island. And then he starts asking me, are you OK? Everything's fine. I said, yeah, everything's fine, sir. What happened? So like, I don't know. Some weird pool brought me all the way here. I don't know what it was. What is your family and friends? Everybody's there. Um, let me ask you a question, he asked me. Where are you from? I said, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. What about you, sir? I said, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, too. And what part of Georgia? I said, I'm from Duluth. And he said, I'm from North Cross. Duluth and North Cross is next to each other. I was like, what? We're neighbors, too. And the guy's like, wow, this is incredible. And in that moment, the, gra the guy grabbed a camera with his phone. I said, oh, my God, look behind you, look behind you. So when I look back, he grabbed the camera and he started filming. I said, what are you talking, sir? So when I look back, the dolphin started jumping behind the boat and it started following us all the way around the island. So when we get to the bay side, the guy said, okay, son, I have to leave you right here. But if you want to leave, if you want to see me again, every Memorial Day, I'm going to be here with my family and you will see my boat. Okay. I said, okay, so thank you so much. Thank you for saving my life. So in that moment, I jump off the boat. The bay side is low, so I could walk. So I jump off the boat and start walking. When I half of the way in that side of the island, almost everybody was gone already. All the people that was looking for me was in the other side of the island, so there was nobody there. And then I I feel something that hit my leg. So when I look back, the dolphin was behind me. So I was like, what? What this dolphin wants with me? So I started crying, like, oh my God, what is this? So the dolphin go all the way with me to the shore. So when I arrive to the shore, I go on my knees and I make a promise to God. And in that moment, I said, you know what, God? 
I'm going to make a promise here. If you send me with this dolphin right here, it's because you have a purpose for my life. So I said, if you send me with this dolphin, if you could just have a purpose. From today, Carlos died into the ocean. The person who's coming out of the water is going to be you. So from this moment, take my life, take my soul, get into me, and whatever you want, do it through me. So in that moment, the dolphin leave. In that moment, it started thundering and lightning. So I took that as a yes. Then everybody started coming from the other side of the island. Everybody started hugging me and crying. The police arrived. They take me back to the park. I have to sign the police reports, what happened, speak with the management of the park. Then people ask me, where do you want to go? So like, could you take me to a church? This was a miracle. They take me to the closest church uh, next to the park, and it's called Virgin Fatima. When we arrived to the church, the church was closed, but they have a garden outside with a chapel. So the chapel was like a cave, and inside of the cave was Virgin Mary. It was full of candles there. So we did a circle in and out of that cave. So we all hug each other in a circle. People that came from the beach, plus all my friends, and we pray for like 20 minutes. After we finish, my friends ask me, what do you want to do? I say, like, take me to the hotel, please. I just need to get something to eat, take a shower and go to sleep. So that's what I, we did. We went back to the hotel. I took a shower, get something to eat, and I go to sleep. In the moment that I'm getting to sleep, I have an epiphany. And the, I never had something like this before. So I have a vision that I, I was on the third floor of a carnival cruise, grabbing the handrails. Then I look in front of me and I see the blue ocean. And at the end of the ocean, I see something that is rising really high. And it was a tsunami. I was like, oh, my God, tsunami, I'm going to die. So I covered my face. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. 5, 10, 15, 30 minutes pass. Nothing happened. And then I asked to myself, like, what's going on with this tsunami? Never going to hit the, this, uh, this place, I mean, the, the carnival cruise. And then somebody behind me touched my back and said, hey, look at me. Open your eyes and look at me. I said, like, no, I don't want to. And he asked me, why? We're about to die. A tsunami is coming. I said, like, we're not going to die. Open your eyes and look at me. I said, no, I don't know who you are. And then he's like, we're not going to die. I said, yes, we're going to die. And then he said, you're never going to die with me. I said, who are you? So I take my hands out of my face. I look back. But when I look back, this guy was like 6'5", uh, kind of skinny, tall. I couldn't see his face. So light was radiating from his face. He was a white uh, rope. He was using a white rope. And then he said, close your eyes, please. So I feel in that moment a lot of peace. So he hugged me from the back. And he said, close your eyes. For 10 seconds, I closed my eyes. And then he said, open your eyes now. So in that moment, I opened my eyes. I look in front of me. I'm in heaven. Heaven, imagine, is like a huge golf course, infinity golf, golf course. Millions of people dressing white robes were, were there. And then I look back. I couldn't see his face yet. I see light it's from his face. But I said, I feel it in my heart. I said, you, Jesus? I said, yes. I said, oh, my God, Jesus, I cannot die right now. Could you take me back? I have a lot to do right now. I said, no, you make a promise to me, and you need to fulfill your promise. So welcome to heaven. From today, you're part of me and part of all of them. From today, you start walking with me and walking with all of them. And I said, oh, my God. He asked me, do you have any questions? I said, yeah, I have a question. Where all these people come from? And Jesus said, they're coming from all over the world. And what is the religions here in heaven? So like in heaven, there is no religions. In heaven, what you're going to find is love. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. And that's what I'm going to unite the whole humanity again. And then he said, okay. He put my, his hands around me and said, let's do a life review. So we start walking in heaven and he started doing a life review of my, my life. And when he finished, he said, okay, it's time for you to go back and tell the world what happened. So he pushed me back. Next day I wake up. I was like, what was that? So anyways, I go back to work on Monday. I tell everybody around me what's happened. I go to my office. I've been working 20 years in my office. So I have three managers there. I start telling the story and everyone like, yeah, right. A dolphin save you. I said, oh, guys, I know you don't believe me. But behind me was my boss. And he said, I believe you. And I look back like, why do you believe me? And they don't believe me. I said, they're atheists. I'm a Christian. And I want you to do the following. Go to your computer and put on Google how many people has been saved by dolphins around the world. So I said, like, what are you talking about? 
I said, just Google it. So I Google how many dolphins have been saved humans. And through history, I mean, a lot of people has been saved by dolphins. I didn't know that. Then he said, now Google how many dolphins get killed in Asia every year. And they're still saving people. They have a, they have a good heart. So I Google it, 100,000 dolphins get killed in Asia every year. Then he said, now Google how many people die every year in Florida by what happened to you. I said, well, by what? By, by riptide current. So I Google it, more than 100 people every year die in Florida, U.S., every year by riptide. It's a silent killer. You know, it take you down and you disappear. And then he said, the last one, I want you to Google what is the meaning of dolphin for Christians? So I, I Google and I'm telling you, Google it you and you will see the response. And the Google said, the meaning of dolphin for Christian is the hope for eternal life. It used to be used thousands of years ago. And it means the dolphin signifies Jesus. You can Google it too and you will see. I was like, wow, I was surprised. I couldn't believe that the dolphin signified Jesus, right? That happened on Monday. On Wednesday, my boss sent me to a customer. One of my employees broke a lamp in a basement. I go to this customer. The customer was busy on the first floor. And she said, Carlos, the lamp is downstairs at the basement. Could you go to the last room in the basement? I said, okay. So I go all the way down to the basement. When I turn the light to see the lamp, next to the lamp, it was a gold lamp. It was a huge painting on the wall. Guess what was on the painting? The whole scenario with Jesus at the dolphin in heaven. Everything that I, I was in, in my epiphany was painting on the wall. So for me, that was a lot to take. So I, it, it was too much to swallow. So I started crying like, oh, my God, this is too much. Please, what is this? What is this? In that moment, the customer come down and said, what's going on? What happened? Are you OK? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Where, I asked the customer, where do you get this painting? It's impossible. I was there with Jesus, and now you have it here in your basement. And she said, three years ago, a friend of my family came here to the basement with a big canvas and did that painting. And that's why we put it at the end of the basement. We don't have more space for that painting. But if you want to take pictures, go ahead. So I took pictures. That was on Wednesday. On Thursday, I called my best friend, told the story. And my friends are like, Carlos, you need to go to church on Sunday and tell everybody your story. So like, are you kidding me? Nobody's going to believe me. And no, 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 I don't want to tell that to anybody. I said, like, Carlos, please do it. So after an hour, he convinced me. On Sunday, I go to his house. We took breakfast with my friend and his wife. And then he asked me, what church you want to go? I said, any church, I don't care. So we go to a church next to his house. It was called St. Michael the Archangel. We Googled the closest church, and that was the closest church. He never been there. I never been there. So when we arrived to the church, the parking lot was full with hundreds of cars were there. And then uh, everybody was celebrating, was music. And then next to us was a lady. And, and we asked, excuse me, ma'am, what's going on here today? And I so said, well, this used to be a little church, but today we're inaugurating a big cathedral. So you guys came in the moment of the inauguration. So come on and enjoy. So we saw the whole inauguration. And at the end, we speak with the priest and told the priest that I have a, a testimony. I said, okay, go ahead, go to the stage. So I go to the stage, I start telling my story. And guess what? When I was in the middle of the story, a 17 year old girl raised her hand and said, excuse me, sir, excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt your story, but uh, I need to ask you a question. I said, like, OK. I said, like, how Jesus was with you? And I said, he was behind me. Uh, while he was dressing, he was dressing a white robe. OK, uh, where are you wearing in front of him? Why? And she said, look at this. She was a skinny girl, white girl with a black long hair and then she put the hair in front of her and turn around when she turned around she have a printing in the back of the teacher it's a painting of jesus hugging a guy so it was like she said it was like this like my teacher and so like, yeah it was like that and everybody in church like oh my god you guys planned this it's like no i don't know her i never see that painting so after church i go home and i google this image jesus hugging a guy and I, I found the image. And the image is called Forgiveness by Thomas Blackchair. And the image comes with a story. And the story is that in 1992, this famous painter, Thomas Blackchair, started doing fasting for weeks, drinking water and praying, asking God, let me paint the image of Jesus. So he started doing the painting. When he was half away, the Holy Spirit showed up and said, Thomas, your painting is good, but you need to explain people everything that is on the painting. 
I said, like, what do you mean? You need to write a book. I need to explain people. So he wrote the book and the book is called Forgiveness and how the forgiveness is how my story ends. So Jesus told me in heaven, in order for humanity to continue living in the best they can, they need to forgive. More than 98% of people around the world have childhood trauma. And the only way that we continue living good is forgiveness. Wow, that's a really strange and exciting experience you had. And what made you write the book? What made you write uh, Heaven, Help from Heaven? Well, number one was uh, because after my experience, I started going to churches, schools, universities, spiritual retreats, uh, telling my story. So everybody started asking me, do you wrote a book about your story? I said, like, no, I, I don't think I should write a book. And everybody's like, yes, you should write a book so we can pass along your story to more people, not just here in the state, to in other countries. But after I heard a lot of people asking me to write a book so they can pass along the story, I wasn't completely convinced to write this for people. So one morning, about three or four years ago, it was around 2 a.m. in the morning, and I hear a thunder in my house. So I wake up, and it was everything was dark, and I was like, what was that? But the thunder, it was like a voice, and the voice said, I want the name of your book be Hell from Heaven. And I was like, what? Who is in there? And so I turn all the lights on. And my heart, I almost just jump out of my chest, <laughs> have a heart attack. And I go to my computer and I type help from heaven. And guess what? When I type help from heaven, the first thing that I'm going to come in Google is a video. So I play the video that says help from heaven. And it's the video, the lyrics are telling me why God wants this book. <laughs> so it's telling almost my story there. there and I couldn't believe it. I was like, what in the world is this? The, the first, first thing that when you tie help from heaven, that video is going to come up. Okay. And you can read the lyrics and you will see what it said. So that was motivating me to write the book. Help from heaven. We all need help from heaven. So, had, had you ever written a book before? No, this is my first time writing the book. And uh, did you do you think this book uh, is somehow part of your mission? It is part of my mission because when I was 14 years old, I made that promise, but I never fulfilled that promise. Now, like 20 something years later, something else happened to me. And it's like, okay, it's time for you to fulfill that promise. So even that I tried to run away from this book because I said, people is not going to believe me you know, haters and all this. I don't want to be confronted with this. But then behind me, I was hearing this voice saying like, you have to write this book. This is a message that people need to hear right now. And that's the message of help from heaven. In these times of pandemic and craziness around the world, that's when people need help from heaven. Okay, something amazing happened to me. I was invited to a retreat for three days. And during the retreat, the last day, the priest come with a, with a Bible and said, put your hands on the top of the Bible and ask God whatever you want, and you're going to have the answer tomorrow. He don't ask the question just to me. He asked the question to the 50 guys that were with me in this spiritual retreat. But you have to put your hands and say it loudly so everybody can listen what you're telling. So Because next day is going to be revealed, right? So I put my hands on the top of the Bible and I say, okay, God, I just need a confirmation that you really want me to write this book. So say something to me that I can really see that you really want this book. Guess what? Next day, the priest take us to a ballroom. There are 50 chairs everywhere, all over the room. And the priest said, you guys can get in and grab any chairs you want. So everybody grab their chair. Now, on the top of the chair, there is an envelope, a manila envelope. You know, the yellow envelope said, yeah. So we grabbed the envelope. He said, I'm going to count till 30, and you're going to start passing the envelopes all over the room. So everybody started passing the envelope. And after 30 seconds, he said, stop. Now put your envelope on your legs. And let me tell you something. You guys enter by your own to this ballroom. You guys choose your own chair, and you guys pass along that envelope. What I'm trying to say is, like, we didn't manipulate the information that is inside of the envelope. 
you will see that's the answer that you've been looking for. Now I want you to open the envelope. So in that moment, when I opened the envelope, guess what? It was a painting made for some kids from, from elementary school. So it was the whole world. Jesus was in the middle of the whole world opening a book. And from inside of the book, the Holy Spirit was coming out. Behind Jesus, people from every country was coming behind the book and behind Jesus. Jesus was holding the book and everybody was running behind him. And after that, it was so impressed to me. I said, okay, this is, this is it. This is the only and the last thing that I need test. I mean, this is it. I mean, it's right here, you know? And that was amazing for me and everybody. Well, like, couldn't believe it. But that's one of, do another reason why I wrote the book. Okay, so what's your advice for people who are facing death or someone they love recently died or is about to die? Does death exist? What do you think? Well, what I, I feel, I've been close to death several times. In the moment, I, I have another accident in my life. But when I'm closing to death, everything seems like going in slow motion. You feel like life paralyzed, but you feel like so much peace inside of yourself so much peace and i've been in, in contact with a lot of people before they die i mean on the dead bed and they can they they tell me like oh look i can see my grandparent came here to the room and nobody can see him but the person that's dying he can see the grandparents oh my wife oh my kids that they already die and they come to the room and this happened to me what i do i go to to hospitals to pray for people and that's when i see this these events, you know, if people call me uh, at the last minute to pray, like for a miracle or something. And I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I cannot make a miracle, you know, that's God. But yeah, of course, I can pray for the person in the last minutes when, when everything is completely finished for that person, you know, they're waiting to die. If someone is interested in buying your book, I think they can get it in Amazon. I'm going to include the link in yes. the description. And also, um, Uh, I, I'm going to put a link of your uh, Facebook group. Okay. Thank and you. if anybody wants to reach you, uh, do you want to give out your uh, email address? Yeah, it's called helpfromheaven1 at yahoo.com. Helpfromheaven1 at yahoo.com. Or you can go to my webpage. It's www.helpfromheaven.org. Great. So it's been a pleasure having you. I'm really glad you came. And uh, thank I you so I, much for inviting me. Yeah, I know people people will like your story and uh, keep doing that uh, work. I mean, you're doing a good job. You have a mission. Your mission you is too. to carry out your uh, your message. And um, I'm really glad uh, I interviewed you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for watching, and I. I send you many, many blessings for everybody that's watching this program right now. Thank you. Thank you.